You noticed something a little different this morning. I'm greeting you from the chancel in our very own sanctuary. This morning is the pilot of our first hybrid worship. We have new camera in the sanctuary that will enable us to not only have worship in the sanctuary, but to simultaneously broadcast it on Zoom. This, like I said, this is that we've, we've run through a couple practices, but this is our first live worship. So I would like to welcome everyone to St. John's United Church of Christ in Fullerton. Um, our goal here is to be able to get really good at doing this hybrid worship. So when the time comes that we can reopen the sanctuary, um, people can be here in the sanctuary to experience the in-person worship, but people who are not ready or comfortable being in the sanctuary can sign on as you are now via Zoom, and you will be participating in exactly the same worship service as the people who in, are in the sanctuary are. So there are a few announcements that I have to share before we begin our time of worship. The pasty sale deadline is March 28th, so be thinking about getting your orders in for that if you're interested. And speaking of deadlines, the deadline for flower orders was last Friday, but when the order was turned in, uh, Margaret got uh, was told by the florist that we can extend that deadline. So if you didn't order Easter flowers and would still like to do that, contact the church office, get your order in. I'm not sure how long that extension will go. So um, contact the, the church office as soon as possible. But you can see, we'll be able to have our Easter Sunday service broadcast from the sanctuary and the flowers will look beautiful de um, decorating our chancel area. Reminder that next Sunday we start daylight saving. So you're gonna spring ahead. And just remember that if you don't, and you sign on um, without having changed your clock, you will miss the entire worship service. So don't forget to do that. Um, a couple of other things, um, just one from me, is that if you um, are interested in um, playing on our church website, this is Deb, our office administrator's responsibility, but she loves some help from folks if anybody is interested in being involved with that. But if you're not interested in playing with it, if you would have time just to look at it, look through it, um, let her know if there's something you'd like to see on that website that's not there, or if there's a mistake, somebody's name is spelled wrong or, or whatever. Um, she would really appreciate the feedback as she begins working on getting that up to date. Our church website is, is the number one place that people go to learn about this church if they want to come and visit. So go to it as a person who doesn't know anything about this church. See if it answers your questions and um, makes you want to come here and learn more. That goes for the pastors who will be applying for your senior pastor position. It's one of the first things they're going to do is check out our church website and our church Facebook page. And um, we want them to have a really positive impression. All right. Um, I have on my notes here that Melissa was going to share, speaking of the search committee, a message from the search committee. Melissa, are you here? Supposed to be here, but I can give a quick announcement. Uh, be, be on the lookout for the third survey that's on the way. It might take a little bit longer for you to read, but it'll be well worth it. And we do appreciate everything that everybody has done as far as returning their surveys. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think on that note, I invite you all to prepare your hearts and minds. We're not doing the worship, uh, or excuse me, the music live yet. That'll be an upcoming step. But the music will be um, live for you. So I invite you to enjoy the prelude music as you prepare your hearts and your minds for worship.
Let us join together in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. The whole earth is God's textbook from the edges of the atmosphere to the core of the planet. The wonders of the world expand our understanding. Rocks have no words, nor do cells have syllables, yet their message can be read anywhere. Even the fiery stars racing through space yield their secrets to those whose minds are open to the mystery of God's universe. Let us join together in singing out loud but muted our opening hymn, God the Sculptor of the Mountains. come before God with our prayer of confession. God of grace, we confess that we do not always honor you as sculptor of all creation, source of all good things, and host at every table. We intend to worship, but instead attend to busyness or busyness. We act out of selfish desire rather than out of integrity. Forgive us. Help us to empty ourselves of all that draws us away from you, that we might be filled with your love and life and be your partners in calling forth your realm of justice, mercy, and peace. Amen. So I may 
words of assurance. The God who gives life unconditionally gives life unconditionally and continually. We are forgiven and offered in each and every moment a chance to begin anew. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite Natalie to unmute and share our gospel lesson for us this morning. Good morning. Our reading today is from the book of John, second chapter, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, <clears throat> both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So ends the reading. Join me in prayer. In the scripture read and your word proclaimed, may we hear what you have to say to us this day. Amen. The sermon this morning is in the form of a first person reflection by one of the vendors in that market during the time of Jesus' um, visit, according to John. You know, lately, I've been wondering if you Christians have ever considered the story of the day that Jesus flipped out in Jerusalem's temple's courtyard from the perspective of people like me. One of the regular vendors who just happened to be manning my table there that day. I know that many of you are excited by what you perceive to have been a righteous display of indignation by Jesus that day. I too have experienced an adrenaline surge due to the courageous words or actions of a person who takes a prophetic stand against injustice or hypocrisy or some other cause that I also deeply believe in. I, too, know what it feels like to want to leap to one's feet and pick up a whip. Well, maybe not a whip. At least maybe to pick up a placard or write a letter or send a contribution on behalf of someone or some group that I believe is being wrongly treated or oppressed or exploited. I, too, have felt a burning desire to right wrongs, to be able to see that Yahweh's will, not Rome's will, not the temple authority's will, not even my own will, but Yahweh's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that part of the prayer that Jesus taught you Christians to pray? To say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've heard you pray to your father in heaven, the one whom Jesus called Abba, father. But was not Jesus' father the Lord of Abraham and Sarah, of Isaac and Rebekah, of the psalmist David, the very one that I too call Lord? Yahweh? You see, you people are not all that different from me than you may think. And that's exactly why you should be careful about cheering too loudly about Jesus's apparent condemnation of me and my fellow animal sellers and money changers. Hear me out. Honestly, we were only trying to do our jobs, and we were trying our best to do them well. Our jobs were important jobs. You see, without us, 
the temple would not have been successful in its ministry, especially to all of those folks who had to travel long distances to worship and to celebrate the great feasts, such as the Passover. We had all studied the law. Torah really was, and still is for that matter, the roadmap for our lives. I can't speak for all of us, but I can tell you that my daily prayer has always been not only that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, but that all of my actions as well would be acceptable to Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. The psalmist lifted up the glory of Yahweh revealed in creation, and we learned to trust Yahweh's faithfulness as we trusted the rising of the sun every morning. We stood in awe of Yahweh's power as we gazed at a million stars, watching lightning streak across the sky, or held a newborn lamb in our arms. And although we relied on Yahweh's law to direct our steps, we were grateful for the signs revealed to us in the heavens and on earth that assured us that we were on the right path. I imagine that you know what I mean. Sometimes it can be hard just hearing words of scripture to know exactly what Yahweh is asking or where Yahweh is pointing us in our particular circumstances. I, for one, am grateful that Yahweh has always been able to speak to us through such simple things as heavens and firmaments, or even a smile of relief shining through dirty, exhausted faces. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me explain. You see, during my lifetime, in the early part of the first century, according to law, animals offered for sacrifice needed to be perfect and free from blemishes. blemishes. Even if some of our customers were able to raise such an animal, it would be nearly impossible for them to transport it the many miles from their home to the temple in Jerusalem where the sacrifice had to take place without some wear or tear. So many people were grateful to be able to purchase the retired lamb or bird or heifer from people like me. I worked hard to ensure that the animals I sold were perfect and that my tired, dirty customers could be assured that their sacrifice would be pleasing to Yahweh. My friends, the money changers, also understood their work as a service to Yahweh and their fellow man, since shekels, which were not commonly used in everyday commerce, were the only acceptable coins for the temple tax. Many taxpayers appreciated the presence of a currency exchange right there in the temple courtyard. Now, I know that many Christians think that the reason Jesus got so upset on that day was that we were cheating our customers by inflating exchange rates or charging exorbitant prices for our sacrificial animals. And I suppose there may have been a few dishonest businessmen among us. I've also heard people say that by setting up shop in the temple courtyard, we were interfering with some people's ability to worship. But like I said, for the most part, we were just trying to do our jobs to the best of our abilities. And at least 99% of us were honest and hardworking and faithful. We believed that the work we were doing was more than acceptable to Yahweh. We truly believed that the work we were doing actually pleased Yahweh. We believed that we were following Torah. And we believed that the gratitude expressed by our customers was affirmation that we were on a faithful path. Isn't that true for you, too? You read the Bible. You do the best you can. You watch for signs of affirmation along the way. I mean, nobody's perfect, but most people I know, at least those who show up in churches or mosques or synagogues, are sincerely trying to live in Yahweh's way as best as they are able. 
And that's true for most of us who were there in the temple that day when Jesus came and started cracking his whip. The temple priests, the money changers, the livestock sellers, all those pilgrims who had arrived in Jerusalem that day, and me, we were all just trying to live faithful lives. So when Jesus started turning the tables and driving us out of the courtyard, we didn't understand what was happening. My animals were squawking and bleeding and running every which way. I tried to help Melchior catch his spotless young heifer who had bolted off in a panic, but then my twin ewes got tangled in some money slack sacks that slid off of Reuben's tables, and Levi was shouting that his legs were pinned under one of his dove crates. I'm telling you, it was chaos. And the whole time, Jesus kept shouting at us to stop making his father's house a marketplace. Honestly, we didn't understand what Jesus was so upset about. And I guess I still really don't. We asked Jesus for a sign that would help us understand why Yahweh would approve of his disruption of the temple and its well-established system. But his only answer was, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. We took offense at his in inference that it was us who were somehow destroying the temple, we who had been faithfully serving there for years, making it possible for people to pay their taxes and offer sacrifices according uh, acceptable to Yahweh, making it possible for our temple institution to thrive. If anyone was destroying the temple, it was him bursting in with his whip and interfering with business as usual there in Yahweh's house. And there was another way his words didn't make sense either. The temple had been under construction for over 46 years. Even if the temple was destroyed by him or by us or, or by anyone. There was no way he would be able to raise it up in just three days. We remember what the psalmist had written, zeal for your house will consume me. If this was how Jesus was going to convey his zeal for Yahweh's house, then from our perspective, he deserved to be consumed. He deserved whatever was coming to him. Like I said, I just didn't get it. And at the time, his disciples didn't seem to understand what he meant either, though I'm told that later they remembered what he had said and realized that he was talking about a different temple, the temple of his body, which they believed was raised after three days in the tomb to be a new dwelling place for God's people. And I think you all believe this too, which makes my warning to you even more important. You see, if you are members of that new household of God, that body of Christ that Jesus was talking about, like I was a member of the temple community, if you are seeking to live God's way by following the roadmap offered by Holy Scriptures and by Jesus, who claimed he was the fulfillment of the law, I beg of you, be careful. Like I said earlier, you're not so very different from me. I know that your community is not even meeting in a building these days, and if you believe what Jesus said about the new dwelling place for God's people, then you know that doesn't really matter to Jesus. But if all you're doing is anxiously looking forward to the day when things can return to the way they were, watch out, will you? Can you possibly imagine that your Jesus, with his whip of cords in his hands, might have been trying to say something, not just to me and to my temple community, but to you? And to your religious community? We certainly couldn't imagine any possible reason for him to be so upset about the traditions and the practices of our temple community. And maybe, just maybe, that 
our inability to imagine or to consider any other way of being the temple community other than the way we had always done things. Maybe that was the problem. I hope that you all are able to take advantage of the time and opportunity that your Lenten season offers you to hear and reflect on what Jesus might be asking of you and to change whatever needs changing before it's too late. By God's grace, may it be so. Amen. I invite you to enjoy the special music prepared for us this morning by Carol Razzler, The Old Rugged Cross. invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, your creation brightens our spirits, especially these days as we watch the new shoots of green popping up from the earth. We see spots of yellow and purple and white bringing us hope and anticipation of the season to come. Gracious creator, hear our prayer. We come before you today as people who are seeking to live in your way, to be open to your guidance, to your direction. We know that we're not always perfect, and we give you thanks that you are perfect and you always forgive us and give us a chance to start over again. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We come before you this morning, God, with many people that we hold in our hearts. We give you thanks for the folks who have worked hard to enable us to continue to worship together during the pandi this pandemic. For indeed, we are together, even though we are sitting in many different places. We feel united in your spirit when we gather together for worship. We give you special thanks for all of the people on the tech team and all of the people on the worship committee and all of the musicians that have just worked hard and inventively to make our worship possible. Gracious God, hear our prayer. 
But there are many that we hold in prayer this morning who are in need of your special touch. We lift to you, Gary and Ruth and Chuck, Terry, Amy, Joey, Damon, Don, Karen, a young baby struggling with heart and lung issues, Beth, Ray, Jackie, Joe, for Sandy's family on the death of her sister-in-law, excuse me, for Marion's family on the death of her sister-in-law, Sandy. God, some of these people, some of us know intimately. Some of these people, we're not even sure who they are. But we know and we trust that you hold each and every one of them in your loving hands. And that you stand ready to pour out whatever it is that they need. Strength, healing, consolation, hope, perseverance, patience. You know, O oh Lord, what gifts are needed in their lives. And we give you thanks, knowing that in your hands they will be blessed. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for those people who are beyond our community. We think this morning of the folks affected by the flooding in Kentucky. We can't imagine where we live having eight feet of water flowing down our streets. And we pray for the people in Texas who are continuing to come out from under the extreme weather that they experience and the extreme electric bills that they've been left with. You remind us, God, that we are one family all around the world. So when one suffers, we feel their pain. Help us not to become hardened by the news of the disasters of the crises, of the tragedies that seem to be happening all around us, that we become numb and forget that each one of these people who is affected is one of your beloved children. Gracious God, hear our prayer. And God, we lift up to you those who are looking forward to celebrations, birthdays, anniversaries, reunions, opportunities to see people that they have not seen in months, if not a year. May they be blessed on the occasion that is forthcoming. God, gracious God, hear our prayer. And hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
the Passover celebration that we read about in the Gospel of John this morning, Jesus cleansed the temple of those who he perceived were there only for their self-interest. He made it clear that the focus of worship is to be God who wants wholeness for all of God's people. Next week, we'll have the opportunity to unite with seven other denominations in giving one great hour of sharing gifts, along with our regular weekly offerings, to share wholeness and healing throughout the world. As children of God, let us give this morning and every day from our hearts and with our hearts and minds focused on God's love for us, for all of God's creation, which is greater than we can possibly imagine. On September 20th, 2017, my sister Milagros and I hid in the back room of our home, the only part made of concrete, as Hurricane Maria tore our house apart. When we finally came out, there was nothing left in place but my sewing machine. I have lived in this house for over 40 years. This is my home, my community. I am praying for the means to rebuild. I am Maria Trinidad, and to have my home back, it is almost more than I can ask or imagine. Let us gather our gifts and our tithes and our offerings together and dedicate them to God. Gracious God, you fill us with your love and with your grace. We offer such humble gifts from our abundance. May the gifts that we give of time, of talent, and of money be used to your purpose to extend your reign of love and grace. Amen. We gather at this table, at the tables where you are, and we remember that how on the night before Jesus died, he gathered with his disciples to share an ordinary meal that had extraordinary implications. For at this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with one who betrayed him. At this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with one who denied him. At this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with those who fled from him in his time of need. At this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with people from all walks of life. And so whenever we gather at this table to share the bread and cup in this community of faith, we proclaim Jesus' life, which affirms that there is a place at this table for all people, for the love of God transcends every power that tries to contain it. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Please join me in the communion prayer. God be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, our loving creator, close to us is breathing and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for your constant love for all that you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world. Gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices with the entire family of your faithful people everywhere. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. 
we remember that on the night before he died, Jesus was gathered at the table with his disciples. And after they had shared a meal together, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. And then he broke it. Saying, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, he gave God thanks, and he passed it to everyone who was there at the table with him, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, my life poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. So we remember Christ's promise that where two or three are gathered in his name, virtually, physically, it doesn't matter. He is with us and among us. Therefore, we boldly proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I invite you to lift your hands in blessing over the elements that you have with you at home, and let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless the bread, bless the fruit of the vine, and bless all of us in our eating and drinking at these tables, that our eyes may be open, that we might recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ gives. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are now ready. This is the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ that unites us as one people. This is the body of Christ that feeds us and nourishes us. This is the body of Christ. Take and eat. This is the cup of blessing, the cup of a new covenant, the blood poured out, flowing as a gift of God's spirit for you, for me, for all people. The cup of blessing. Take and drink. And let us join together in a prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks, O oh God, because in your own free gift of love, you have reached out to us. You have refreshed us at your table, touched our deepest needs, and called us to a life shared in memory and in hope. Send us forth with courage and joy in the name of Jesus Christ, that we, too, may become bread and peace for one another and for the world. Amen. Now let us join together in singing out loud but muted our closing hymn, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross.
Now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and grant you peace. Now go in peace to worship, to love, to serve, no, no matter, matter what. what. <laughs>